Hello, this is Father Tracy. Thank you for tuning in to this broadcast on the SFX channel. Today I want to talk about the ways that people encounter their spiritual side. We have learned over the years that people encounter spiritual things as they do other realities in life through four portals. There is the portal of the emotions, the portal of the intellect, the portal of the imagination, and finally, the portal of human experience. During this broadcast, I will discuss each of these in detail, but right now, let's start with the portal of the emotions. We sometimes refer to them as feelings. They can be looked upon sometimes as inclinations. Now, a person will find that he experiences emotions divided into four categories that are best described as mad, sad, glad, and afraid. A person can find himself joyful, can find himself angry and upset. He can find himself really depressed in a terrible mood, or he can find himself afraid. And for a lot of people, emotions are the pathways through which they experience reality. Rather than experience reality through the mind, they do so through the emotions, through their feelings. A situation feels right or it feels wrong. A person feels good or a person doesn't feel good around me. Sometimes people who depend upon emotions will identify emotions as to a glove that fits on a hand or a well tailored suit of clothing, things like that. The emotions can tell us something about a person. So for instance, the emotion of fear, completely uncontrollable, will cause a person either to put his head in the sand and hide or run, that would be the flee or fight result, or if the emotion is used correctly, it could point out to a person which he feels is important in his life. The emotion of fear highlights what a person considers to be important. So for instance, if a man is afraid of his creditors, that would indicate, for instance, that his reputation for integrity and for ability to pay his debts is very important to him and he would be then loath to lose it. On the other hand, a person improperly using that emotion of fear can use it to either hide from his creditors or to deny the fact that he has debts. The emotion of gladness is also a really interesting emotion because it could also be called the emotion of a manipulation. If a person knows how to create a sense of gladness or joy in another person, he can manipulate that person. Sometimes we call that pushing the right buttons. And so if a person wants to, for instance, defraud somebody else in selling him a used car and hide some defects in the car, he points out the gladness and the joy that will come from that car and try to instill those emotions in the prospective sucker. Another thing that we could say about the emotion of anger is anger can also be a great manipulator. A person wanting to manipulate another person will try to induce the emotion of anger in the manipulatee, we might say, to incite him to react against somebody else, a third person. Sadness is a little more difficult. Sadness is generally used in conjunction with joy. A person would say, gee, you look a little down today. Let me show you what will cheer you up. People that perceive reality through emotions can have a very, very full life, experiencing the world and all of its different dimensions, its colors, its smells, its temperatures, its feel, its beauty. But they need to be very wary because the emotions, since they are involuntary, are very transitory. And that's where we come to the problem with people who seek God through their emotions. For a lot of people, emotional experiences of God are the primary vehicle that they use to find God. And they need, though, to be very careful that they pass through the emotions 
into the intellectual part of their person in order for it to affect their lives. Some religions like to capitalize on emotions because as long as they can manipulate a person into feeling happy and feeling glad, they can separate that person from a lot of his money. Sometimes a religionist, we might say, who wants to prey on a person through the emotion of sadness will approach somebody who is grieving over a death and will promise some type of contact with the other world, as it were, or the other side, and try to bring joy and happiness into that person's life by making contact with the person's dead relative, for example. Fear is also used by religionists at times because everybody in his heart generally has a little, little bit of fear from punishment or fear of punishment from something. And so a religionist who is attempting to manipulate somebody said, you know, if you don't do what I tell you to do, translated, if you don't write me a big check, God might punish you. And then, of course, we have the emotion of anger person can feel deprived of something. He can ask himself, why do all of my friends have better cars than I do and better jobs? Why does it seem that I always come out on the short end of a stick? And a manipulative religionist will say, that's because God is punishing you. You must have done something to really irritate God. And so what we have to do is we have to make that up and we have to get you back in church. Oh, and by the way, how much should we put down here on your pledge card? And what is your bank routing number and checking account number? Emotions are part of life. Emotions are part of who the human person is and we can't deny them. All that we need to do, especially in matters of religion, is keep them in perspective. Used properly, they can bring a person to a deep knowledge and encounter with the divine, but used improperly, they can cause and wreak havoc in a person's life. Now that we have heard how emotions work in our lives, let's consider how some people will encounter the mark of the artisan, the mark of their creator and their being through the use of their intellect. Intellect is the data gatherer, be it from reading books or from smelling trails on the woods or from observing colors or sensing atmospheric pressure changes, both the human person and animals accumulate data. They sift the data and evaluate the data and use their data experiences to influence immediate and future behaviors. Many people approach reality from the standpoint of their intellect. They assert that if they don't understand something, it doesn't exist. I remember talking to a four-year-old girl once and we were talking about the Santa Claus event and she was describing to me that Santa Claus was going to visit her house and all these other houses on the block and I asked how does he get into the house and she told me he comes down through a chimney and I said well I'm looking across the street and I see a house without a chimney how does Santa Claus get into that house and she said, oh, don't you understand anything? She says, Santa Claus can do whatever he wants. And that is the way she handled the problem of not being able to understand what was really going on in life. That Santa Claus was putting in childlike terms the human virtue of generosity. Well, when a person gets into the question of religion and faith, intellect can be both an aid and it can also be a hindrance. It's an aid when a person can properly evaluate what his forebears and his ancestors have found regarding religion. And it can be a hindrance when a person limits his understanding of God only to what he can understand. Because many religions postulate, that is simply assume, a God that cannot be fully understood. And so when a person limits his understanding of God to what he can understand, he is severely limiting his religious response. Intellectual understanding is part of what God has given us to
to help us understand who he is. A person belonging to one of their adhering to one of the Eastern religions, for instance, could never understand the endless progression of life. And it is the progression of life, the renewal of life that becomes his God. Another person from the Frax, another Eastern religion, could see that he experiences truth and happiness in his life, that he goes through stages of purification. And he can then say, well, I just don't understand how this can happen. I don't understand how many of these things I'm going to have to go through, but I'm ready to go forward in my religion because I know it's making my life better. And then, of course, we have some people, like some fundamentalist Christians in our Christian world, that severely limit their understanding of God because they limit it to a cursory intellectual understanding of the Bible. And as such, they close themselves out to a lot of what God has revealed to us. The Jewish understanding of God is through the saving power that he demonstrated with the people's exodus, the exodus of the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt into the promised land. And they see everything within that light. They see God's goodness. They understand and have insights into the mind of God through the Ten Commandments. They have a very, very high intellectual understanding of who God is for them. And so the intellect, you see, is something that we use all the time. But as with the emotions, it's very important that we keep it in check. The intellect, along with the emotions, and along with other attributes of how a person experiences reality, all form parts of Catholicism. And the Catholic faith suggests that a person use many, many different ways to come to know who God is, all at the same time not limiting God to what can be understood. In addition to the emotional and the intellectual portals, some people encounter the mark of God in their lives, the mark of the artisan, as it were, but through the use of their imagination. For instance, a person will look around him and he will say, I wonder what is inside that closed room. Somebody else might say, I wonder what causes the sun to shine. And a third person might say, I wonder why she likes me or why he doesn't like me. The answer to those questions generally is not determined intellectually at the beginning. The answer to questions such as that come from the use of the human imagination. That is a conjuring up in the mind of various possible answers. And the person then will select the answer that seems most probable to him at a time. So for instance, a 14 year old boy or girl leaving grammar school or junior high school or middle school, whatever you call it these days, moving on to ninth grade in high school in a new building, in a new environment, with new school companions, will try to imagine what that experience is going to be like. And since the human body likes to be happy, the human person enjoys gladness, the young person will imagine a time of great companionship, a time of great growth, falling in love, but more importantly, a time of new opportunities. And the imagination constructs these opportunities, which many times, of course, if not all the time, don't necessarily conform to what happens, but the imagination kind of fills in the blanks. Imagine a person moving to a new job, somebody moving into a new apartment or a new house. The imagination fills in all the blanks as to how the job is going to be carried out, what the house is going to contain, and things like that. The human imagination is a great part of the human person because it helps us understand reality in a way that can be quite pleasant and quite pleasurable. Now let's see if we can apply this to the matter of religion. Every religion attempts to answer three questions. The first question is, where did I come from? The second question is, why am I here? And the third question is, to where am I going? Which for a lot of people becomes the most important. For instance, the Jewish faith and the Christian faith answer very well, where did I come from? I am either a member of the chosen people of God 
or God created me individually and uniquely, created me as who I am, gave me my own identity. My physical characteristics may have come from my mother and my father, but the characteristics that animate me into being my person come from God. Generally, a person can kind of imagine that a little bit and then set it aside. And then also, we have the question of why am I here? The reason I am here, for instance, according to the Catholic faith, is I am here to know, love, and serve God in this life in order to be happy with him in the next. In some other religions, these are answered in a similar way. Now, in the third case, for instance, to where am I going, we find that there are differences between different religions. In the Christian faith, we believe we are going to eternal life, but that's done in a very, very, what can we say, imaginative way. The Mormon religion, on the other side, or on the other hand, proposes a celestial kingdom in which each faithful believer will have his own planet and his own universe, his own way of ruling over things. We have the Eastern religions speaking of reincarnation and cycles of life and of achieving some type of spiritual happiness. But in each one of these questions, the answer is supplied by the imagination. We don't know really precisely where we come from because we have to imagine a God. We can understand biology. We can understand chemistry. We can understand any number of the natural sciences, but we have a very hard time imagining what makes me, me, and you, you. It's called in philosophy, differentiation. You could have two biologically identical twins, and yet they are obviously different people and they have different personalities. And that's something that a person can only imagine. Why are we here requires also some imagination. There are some people that say, I am here in this life in order that I might live it to the fullest. And I can imagine exactly how I'm going to do that. They would say, I don't know where I'm going. I don't really have any concern over that. It doesn't make too much difference to me. And because I can't control it, it's out of my sphere, so to speak. And so that person concentrates on the here and now. And there are some religions that will allow that to happen. Some of the ancient religions, the religion of paganism, for instance, and they don't answer very well to where am I going? Going to sleep with the ancestors or something along those lines. Imagination also plays a part in to where am I going? For the Mormon, for instance, it's pretty clear cut. Mormon revelation explains what that's going to be like. But for the Christian, it's quite vague because Christian revelation simply tells us that for the faithful believer, there will be eternal life that is life without end in a restored world with characteristics of life that we cannot now experience. I don't know what it would be like to be living with a resurrected body. I have to imagine what my body will be like. Will it be the 240 pounder with arthritis or will it be the 170 pounder that graduated from high school sometime in the past? We just don't know and we have to use our imagination. Imagination is a powerful faculty that as human beings we share with each other. Imagination allows us to connect with each other. Husband and wife can imagine life with children and grandchildren. Husband and wife can imagine a common life well down the road from what they are experiencing at any one time, or they can simply live in the moment and say, tomorrow will be what tomorrow will be. Let's enjoy ourselves today. We can find children, playmates, classmates doing exactly the same thing. Using imagination to experience reality then becomes a very, very powerful tool. And when we combine it with the emotions, the human emotions, and we combine it with the intellect, and especially in the religious sphere, we can find ourselves being prepared to imagine the reality of God. Finally, after we have discussed the portal of the emotions, the intellectual portal, and the portal of the imagination, we find ourselves coming then to human experience as a portal that will enable a person to come into contact with the God 
who created him in his image and likeness. That is, that reality consists of only what I can experience. This is easily pointed out by a 16th or 17th century example that talks of a person taking a hand and putting it in cold water, ice water, and then putting it into a pan of water at room temperature and the water feeling very warm. And then the next day, sitting out in the sun at roughly 100 degrees and coming in and putting his hand in that same bucket of household temperature water and having the water feel very cool. That's an old example that they use to show that the human experience, the human senses are very, very unreliable in trying to understand what reality is. And yet we find people doing that all the time. People all the time will say that if I don't experience it, it hasn't happened. If I don't really, really have an experience, these things just don't exist. To take an example from Christianity, when Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to the apostles at one time, St. Thomas was not there. The other apostles, the other 10, that time told Thomas that the Lord had been there. And Thomas said, I don't believe it unless I can put my hand in his side and unless I could put my finger in the nail holes and his hands and his feet, I won't believe it. Thomas was saying, I have to experience it. I am not going to rely on what you tell me. And of course, we know that as the story developed, he did have that opportunity. And after he experienced the sword holes and the nail holes in Jesus' body, he did then be able to say that he believed in other matters of religion. People say there is no God because I can't see him. Where is he? Where does he live? If I can't see God, there is no God. If I can't talk to him, there is no God. If I can't even imagine him, there is no God. And because some people say he is unimaginable, then he is certainly too remote to concern himself with me and me with him. And that's why I say that using human experience is really a bad choice when used exclusively. But on the other hand, when a person uses his human experience to help him evaluate his emotions, for instance, it can be a very, very good choice. A person who has a spiritual experience with God will know that that also will produce an emotional response in him. When a person, for instance, senses the emotion of anger, when the chest tightens, when the breathing becomes more rapid, human experience will tell him to take a deep breath, count to 10, open a can of beer, throw something, drive fast. But did you notice that it also would work with the intellect? That if a person knows from the data of his past experience that certain results are predictable, he then knows when he sifts the experience of a present moment what he can instantly discard and what he should really plan on keeping and filing away for a long time. He uses the intellect to remember what has happened to him in the past. So the child knows that the stove is hot. Human experience told him that it hurt a lot to put his hand on the stove and so when he's tempted to climb up to the stove to see what's in the pot, the intellect says, you better watch out. Remember what happened the last time that you did this. You see, that's how the intellect and human experience work together. And it is the same way with God and religion. One of the purposes of religion is to provide for happiness. And if a person's practice of religion has produced happiness in the past, there's a reasonable expectation it will produce happiness in the future. A person can use experience of other people's religious lives in order to see that there is a possibility for happiness in his own life. And finally then, we have the matter of experience and imagination. And I'm not going to mention, of course, the known fact that usually imaginations are quite incorrect and inaccurate. But what I do want to point out is that human experience can tell us that imaginary living can be a lot of fun. And that when we can imagine a good future, human experience tells us that we are more inclined then to step forward 
and live in such a way that we would realize that future. And so it is then with religion. I think you can see from our looking at reality through these four lenses that they are completely apropos for religion. And we can deduce from that then that religion is a reality. And we use the gifts that God has given us. We use the gifts that we have so as to come to understand the reality of who we are. We are a being seeking to know from where we have come.